Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! Let me tell you a story that still feels unreal to me, even though I lived through every moment of it. It's about my neighbor, Mrs. Dalton. I live in a quiet neighborhood, a kind where everyone knows each other. My parents, who are the sweetest souls, own a decent-sized house with a spare guest room. That room, as fate would have it, became the center of our bizarre tale. It all started when Mrs. Dalton, our next-door neighbor, came knocking. She's always been a bit nosy and entitled, but we never thought much of it. She had her son, Mark, with her, a man in his mid-thirties looking as if life had just handed him a bunch of lemons. My dear neighbors, she began. I have a small favor to ask. You see, Mark here has run into some financial troubles. I was wondering if he could stay in your guest room for a while, rent-free, of course, just until he gets back on his feet. I was taken aback to say the least. We hardly knew Mark, and the request seemed outrageous. But my parents, being the kind souls they are, agreed to let him stay for a month out of neighborly kindness. And don't ask me why she didn't host him instead, because I have no idea whatsoever. The first week went smoothly, Mark kept to himself and we barely noticed his presence. But soon his wife and two kids showed up, and our quiet home turned into a chaotic mess. They acted as if they owned the place, leaving messes everywhere and even demanding special meals. I decided to have a talk with Mrs. Dalton. This arrangement isn't working out, I told her politely. We agreed to help Mark not host his entire family indefinitely. And that's when things took a wild turn. Mrs. Dalton's demeanor changed instantly. You can't kick them out, she hissed. If you do, I'll tell everyone that you've been harassing me and my family. I have friends at the local news station, you know. I was shocked. This was outright blackmail. But I stood my ground. We don't respond well to threats, I said firmly. Your son and his family have a week to find another place to stay. The next few days were tense. Mark and his family packed up in silence. But Mrs. Dalton wasn't done. She started a loud public tirade against us, accusing us of all sorts of ridiculous things. She even went as far as to stage a protest on our foot lawn, attracting a small crowd of onlookers. That's just stupid. And that's when the police arrived after I called them. Mrs. Dalton and her friends here refused to calm down, screaming about injustice and entitlement. The officers, having none of it, handcuffed her and took her away for causing a public disturbance and harassment. In the end, Mark and his family lived quietly and we haven't heard from them since. As for Mrs. Dalton, she was released with a warning, but her reputation in the neighborhood took a serious hit. People started avoiding her and she eventually moved away. I used to live in a modular housing community, also known as Trailer Park. <laughs> that was basically a quiet retirement community with little traffic, crime or animosity between neighbors. Good ownership and management kept it that way and everyone was happy living there. The police would occasionally cruise through but only because they enjoyed spending some quiet time in an area of town that wasn't riddled with crime. It was a break for them. We enjoyed having them there mostly to talk baseball and exchange joke swiz. Within a couple of years though, the community was sold to a new owner slash management company and they basically let anyone who could pay the lot rent in without any vetting to keep the unruly out. The place went to hell within three months with loud parties at night and plenty of crime with the police there literally every night shutting down parties, arresting drug dealers, investigating break-ins and such. I lived at a space that was located at the top of where two roads connected to form a T dead-ended intersection and one of our new tenants liked to drive their ridiculously lowered vehicle with an exhaust system that amplified the engine noise to its loudest. Through the park, late at night, and do a nightly U-turn over my lawn and driveway so they could head back down the road, they just came up. I'm guessing primarily to double the noise in a neighborhood while avoiding having to turn too sharply with their modified suspension by driving over my lawn. This repeatedly happened and sometimes the tire tracks were as much as 3-4 to four feet over the road into my lawn 
and I crossed my driveway. The lawn actually belonged to the park, but it was my contractual responsibility to keep the lawn and the rest of the property looking nice. So naturally, I was PO'd at having to repeatedly fix my lawn because a jerk down the street enjoyed driving on it and tearing it up. I went to the park's new management, complained about the damage the new neighbors were doing to my lawn and got the typical trifecta response. First, we don't care because it's really park property and you still have to maintain it. Second, we don't care because we want the increased lot revenue from the new tenant more. And third, stop being a Karen and suck it up and shut up because we don't care since you're on an old contract at a low, low fixed rental rate that we cannot legally jack up through the roof. I reread my contract closely to make sure I was within my tenant rights relating to temporary landscape improvements. I went to the river to find two large smooth river rocks that had just the right shape and weight as temporary landscape improvement. Around 4 to 6 inches high, I weighted at least 25 pounds each. After a couple of hours, I found just the right ones, hauled them off and painted them green to match the lawn. Painted some decorative flowers on the sides as well. And I popped one down in each corner of my lawn and driveway. We shall say purely for atheistic enhancement. About 2 in the morning that night, I could hear the jerk with a super loud exhaust pipe on his car was a ridiculously lowered suspension coming down the road to perform his usual U-turn over my lawn. I sat in my darkened house watching with glee as he ran up over the rocks. Got high centered and had to jack out the car to get the rocks out from underneath. They also knocked his suspension loose with one front tire aiming off in a slightly different direction than the other and completely detached the super loud exhaust pipe that the jerk had to chuck into the back seat of his car. The best part was watching him slowly limp his now very quiet but squarely steering car back down the road the direction it came. The next day in the afternoon, surprisingly, the park manager knocked to my door and said that they had received a complaint that I had damaged another tenant's vehicle by placing rocks in the road. And he wanted an explanation. I grabbed my park contract and showed them my new decorative landscape enhancements placed fully within the boundaries of my lawn. I made it a sickingly repetitive point to make sure the park manager saw both the tire tracks and the result damage to my lawn, the scratches the undercarriage did to my new decorative rocks, and a section in my contract regarding temporary landscape improvements. And I explained the rocks were there to stay until I got eviction papers. I never heard super loud pipes or from the manager again. And my lawn remained perfect after that. A little backstory. I'm a Vietnamese American. I was born in the US, but I have Vietnamese origins. I went to visit the city in Vietnam where my mom grew up, Da Nang. For those of you who don't know, Da Nang is a beautiful city with skyscrapers and a beautiful community. The houses are well built and it's very advanced. It's considered by some as Vietnam's pride. Or at least that's what I call it anyway. However, one thing you shouldn't underestimate is the Da Nang police. Their police is a very strict police department with great leadership and skill. These men and women in the police department are trained for lots of things, ranging from small minor stuff to emergencies. One thing you should note, Da Nang police will not take crap from anyone. This Karen did not know that. I was at this super huge market. This market is basically like a mall space full of clothing, shoes, accessories, food, everything you ever need. I was helping an elderly woman shop for some stuff. And at the end, I felt the tug of my jacket and I pulled back. I turned around to see a white woman in her 40s in front of me. She's around 230 pounds and it looked like she smoked a pack of cigarettes for like two years straight before quitting. It also looked like she didn't shower much because... Her hygiene on her clothes and overall breath didn't settle too well on me. Hygiene did not give this woman any good looks at all. Her face drooped and I just stopped studying her after that. Too much to see. She says, Finally, I've been waiting for you forever. I saw her walk in the aisle about five minutes ago. 
Uh, can I help you? Yes. Can you tell me where the shoes are? My son and I need new shoes now. Yeah, they are over there. No, you are going to get me my shoes. Not walking there. It's too far. Get them for me now. No, who the hell do you think you are for? Pulling me back and been telling me to get shoes for you. But you haven't even told me what size or design you want. And regardless, I'm not going to do that for you. The Karen looked shocked. And she turned red. Oh, how dare anyone talk back to me like that. You jerk. Who the hell do you think you are? How dare you talk to me like that? The customer is always right. I want to speak to your freaking manager now. Does this place even have a manager? Shut the hell up, lady. Why are you creating a scene? What? How could an employee like you talk to me like that? It clicked in my head that she thought I was an employee. I just burst out laughing. Are you laughing? What for? I got an idea. I'll play along. Yes, I work here. By all know am I servicing white crab like you. The Karen went full berserk mode. She pushed me against the shelf and a few things fell on me. She then stomped away. The end. <laughs> Just kidding. I thought it was the end. It certainly wasn't. She comes with a person in charge in the market. Me and the manager exchange greetings in Vietnamese and the manager turns to the woman and the conversation ensues. He tells her, he no work here. He customer. He does work here. He said it himself. Please no yell. Yell? No okay. You're just covering for him, you freaking jerk. You people are the freaking worst. I'm shocked, but the manager seems unfazed. She doesn't seem to understand what that means. I told her in Vietnamese what it meant and she got taken aback and looked horrified. The hell are you saying in Chinese? You should have a boss to tell me. Sure, and it's Vietnamese, not Chinese. I was basically translating to her in Vietnamese what you just said to us. She didn't understand English. You sly jerk. That's not what you said. Yes, it was. Uh, Karen punched the manager in the face. And the poor manager got knocked out. Then she attempted to hit me. I kicked her in the side of her leg and elbowed her back. I took out my phone and dialed 113. Within minutes, four police cars surrounded the front entrance of the market outside. Officers in black uniforms and tactical vests and helmets and regular officers in green uniforms surrounded the aisles from both ways. They asked me to step away. I stepped away and the officers attempted to arrest her. And by attempted, I mean attempted. The giant elephant kicked the officers in the legs and tried to run away. Bad idea. The officers pulled her back and surrounded her. One of them takes a baton and hits her in the side of the leg. The other officers kick her in the back of the leg and make the arrest. She was literally carried out of the market, handcuffed into the car. Some paramedics come inside and help out the manager. I decide I was done with shopping and I just paid and left to go to the hotel room. I, 27 female and my partner, 26 male, Recently had our first baby at the end of October. We live far from both of our families, the closest being 5 hours away and have few friends that live around us. Because of this, I opted out of having a baby shower. My partner's parents and their friends decided they were going to throw a baby shower for me. Which, while I was very grateful that they would be willing to do that, I was against the idea because I didn't even know their friend that offered to host the shower and I wouldn't know 99% of the guests, and the thought of going to a party dedicated to me and my baby with a bunch of people I don't know, getting me gifts, was just something that made me uncomfortable. But they insisted. Come the day of the shower, we traveled 5 hours to my in-laws friend's house, and she went all out. Even getting handmade soaps made with my baby's name on them, and this made me even more uncomfortable. I grew up in a low-income household, so I'm not used to this kind of thing. I didn't know anyone there and just felt very out of place. It felt more like a party for my in-laws than anything else. At the end of the shower, I thanked everyone profusely, especially the host, going so out of their way for someone they never met. Come a month later, my baby was delivered five weeks early because I had preeclampsia and she was under five pounds. 
My partner and I had to send a lot of money getting preemie stuff. We also decided that since I only had 8 weeks of unpaid maternity leave, that I wouldn't be going back to work, as our daughter was premature and the cost of childcare around where we live would be more than half of my salary slash a month. Deciding to become a one-income household and having a new baby, plus it being so close to Christmas, we are making big sacrifices to be able to afford to give our baby the best life. That brings us to now, after having an argument with Zim, that we weren't going to travel 5 plus hours with a newborn to spend her first Christmas with him, and they expressed that they, and some guests, were very very upset we hadn't sent that thank you card yet since they had gone so out of their way. I never asked to have a baby shower and even was against the idea at first. I don't want to seem ungrateful, I'm very grateful and have expressed so endlessly, but I don't even know the names of most of the people that came let alone their addresses to send them a card. They also know that we are trying to save as much money as possible to be able to compensate for my loss of income and spending money on thank you cards and postage seems unnecessary to me. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I've never received a thank you card from any gift I've given as a baby shower, nor did I ever expect one. So, am I the jerk here? And now some comments on the post. Someone saying, everybody's a jerk. You have a lot going on, but yes, you need to send thank you notes. These people spend time and money doing something nice and trying to establish a bond with you. This doesn't have to be a big deal and your husband needs to do half the work. Get the addresses from your mother-in-law. You can get thank you notes from Walmart or Amazon for about $10 for a box of 25 Create a template of four basic sentences to use and modify only to personalize. Thank you so much for the XXX. It will be very helpful in bathing, feeding, cuddling, dressing the baby. As you may have heard, baby came early, so it's been an exciting but exhausting time for us. It was nice to meet you at the shower and I hope to see you again next time we visit. Assuming about 20 people came, you can finish this project in an hour and for under 25 bucks. Another commenter adds, you need to send thank you notes. I am not going to call you the jerk since you have had a lot of stuff going on and there is still time to fix this. But it seems like you're looking for excuses to not thank people for gifts they gave you. You don't mention your husband has a broken hand or is illiterate. Is there any reason he can't do it? Nobody likes writing thank you notes, but it's something you should do. Have your husband ask your in-laws for the names and addresses and just get it over with. The third commenter goes with, not the jerk. I have given plenty of baby shower gifts and received precisely one card in return. It was nice to get one, but it never bothered me not to receive one. All these you're the jerk comments seem overblown. Even if thank you cards are the norm for this group of people, they can give the parents of a brand new preemie baby some grace. I also find it somewhat condescending of some commenters to assert that, because their social norm is to send a thank you card, all those who don't are rude and ill-mannered. Just feels a bit classist. If you're planning on doing something, get your partner to sort it. When in-laws are causing a fuss, it makes sense for the relevant partner to step in. He will be more likely to know who these people are anyway. Also, presumably, he would have known ahead of time that thank you cards were expected. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.